And welcome back to another episode of the Outside 50 podcast presented by U.S. Footy News. I am your host, Rick Shaibani. Alongside me is Ben Martinez. How you doing, Ben? Going well, thanks. How about yourself? Good day, Ben. Doing well, doing well. And Tara could not be with us today, um, but she will be rejoining us for the subsequent podcasts. And today we have a couple of Chicago Swans in the house. We've got Stu Nickel and Al McGlashan. Good day, guys. How you doing, boys? Hey, how we doing? Going well, thanks, guys. Great to have you on. Yeah, yeah, it's it's great to have a, a few more Midwest faces. Obviously, we had Wisconsin, uh, we had Caitlin on previously, and it's good to uh, see you guys and talk a little bit about footy in that part of the world. So uh, let's just get right into it. Um, firstly, how did you guys end up in Chicago, and uh, when did you get involved with the Swans? Well, I uh, moved to Chicago about seven years ago. I um, was actually studying abroad in Milwaukee and kind of came down to Chicago for a day. And I was like, oh, you know, this city's pretty cool. And finishing up uni back home, there just wasn't a lot of work that was going around. So I thought I'll come to Chicago for a year. And that was, uh, yeah, that was seven years ago. And you know, honestly, I, I, I fell into footy. Like I, I spent 10 years in Australia, but I was born in Scotland and never played footy when I lived in, in Australia. I came over here, played some soccer and just the, uh, the social aspect was lagging, then came down to training and then made it home like three days later. So I was like, yeah, this is exactly the kind of club that I want to join and be part of. So it's, uh, yeah, it's been gung-ho ever since. Great. That's, it's crazy how everyone winds up playing the sport or for Aussies, you know, how they end up finding their way to the States and, we were just, I was just talking with Al uh, before we started recording, you know, he's been here 21 years now and it was originally just going to be a, a short trip, right Al? Yeah, I moved, uh, I moved here back in 99 with my, uh, with my ex, I guess you'd say, and uh, we moved over from Australia. We were supposed to be in Chicago for nine months, two in Detroit, months in Europe and then back to Australia. And, uh, 21 years later, here I am sitting in isolation, um, dodging the dodging the illness, but uh, yeah, still here, still here, still playing footy with the Swans. So yeah, it's been quite a trip. Sounds like it. Um, yeah, I, when I first got here, I, uh, I was playing footy back home. I was playing footy in Geelong and knowing that I was only going to be here or expecting to be here for like that short stint, I was actually looking for American football. Um, sort of, uh, I guess, naive and, and ignorance, not realising they didn't have the, the same sort of setup here. I thought I'd just be able to you know, move into a town and try out and try and have a, have a, a whatever you want to call it, a throw, a kick, a, a, a tackle, and um, I couldn't find anything. And I'd heard about the Swans in a newspaper article um, before I'd left, but I really hadn't had any intention on playing footy. Um, I said I really was set on having a crack at the US. And uh, stumbled across it in a football magazine. It was a magazine called Windy City Sports. I was going through the football classifieds to see what they had there. And I had AAA, Aussie Rules Football. It was the first, uh, first listing. And yeah, I said 21 years later, here I am on this podcast. That's, uh, that's really cool. And um, yeah, you kind of missed the, the bandwagon for gridiron. Cause you know, there are all these Aussie punters in American football these days. And, uh, but no, I mean, back in 99, the USAFL was still in its infancy and the Swans were too. Cause uh, as we all know, footy kind of started with like, you know, your Cincinnati's, your Louisville's, your Cleveland's, those types of Midwestern teams. So yeah, you've been with the Swans almost since the beginning. Yeah, pretty much. I think, I mean, I got here, it said 99 was August. So I played a handful of games before the Nationals that were in Cincy that year. They'd been previously, I think really like maybe the first season they'd truly been the Swans. Before before that, they'd been the mob where they'd been tied in with uh, Milwaukee. Um, and before that, I mean, yeah, literally nothing. So it was like basically the second year, I think, if I, if I you know, dug hard enough into the history. 
Yeah, we have a bloke at our club uh, with the Dragons. Uh, a lot of people don't know that L.A. tried starting a club, like, in again, in the 90s when the USAFL first took off, um, the L.A. Crows, and that didn't last. But uh, uh, Bobby Wagner and a few other guys uh, in L.A., they kind of stuck around and eventually reformed. We had, you know, a few Metro teams in, like, the mid-2000s before the Dragons officially were born in 2010. So it was kind of one of those things where persistence paid off and we were just happy to get it up and running again. Yeah, Steve. Yeah, and I, and I think it's, you know, I mean, having, you know, Milwaukee, uh, the Bombers kind of fall to the wayside in the last couple of years and seeing the Wombats kind of spring up, having those, you know, teams that are coming through and, and growing uh, the game, especially close to us, um, you know, it, it helps us actually create, you know, a, a better rivalry with, with close. I mean, our, our, our biggest rival the last couple of years would be Minnesota freeze. And that's like an eight hour drive. So having some, a club that's coming through and growing as much as, uh, as the Wombats have in the last couple of years is, you know, you're right, Rick, it's just persistence, um, you know, and getting around one another when, when you do see those, uh, the, the wave of growth, uh, coming through. So it's, uh, excited to see. You know, kind of what happens with the Wombats and, you know, hopefully they, they, they'll stick around as well and the Bombers will get back on their feet too so we can have a more Midwest competition. Oh, absolutely. And yeah, Caitlin was talking about that just the other day when we were interviewing her for the podcast. Uh, you know, obviously she's a president of, of the Wombats and and Racine hosted nationals. You know, they're they're doing pretty well for such a young club. And she was saying that you guys in Chicago – uh, the Minnesota people, the Des Moines people have been, you know, nothing but helpful in terms of just helping get them on their feet. And yeah, Minnesota has done really well. They're always competitive. They always do really strongly at regionals and, uh, and even further South in the central region, you know, Dallas does a great job. Oklahoma is doing pretty decently. And yeah, there's a lot of potential in terms of kind of stretching the influence of footy to where it's not always the Austins or the LA's or the San Fran's or the New York's. There's a lot of other talent all over the country. And uh, it's exciting to see you guys continue to continue to grow and thrive and be competitive. Very true, Rick. Yeah. Stu and Al, um, just to go back to your background, but also the, the club in general. I mean, it's such a proud club, you know, look, just looking at the history there since, you know, 2005, like you said, Al, before that, there was the, it was the mob. What, what's what been the key to growth for that club? Um, you know, I know personally you've got one of the biggest Australia Day parties in the country. You've got an amazing AFL grand final party, but let, let's face it, you're also in a, in a sporting mecca. You've got, you know, the, the Black Hawks. You, you're in a city that has had some of the the biggest dynasties when it comes to professional sports um, in, in basically in every, in every format. What do you feel has been the, the key to the growth of the Swans? Um. So when I first came, uh, the USAFL and the Swans were very different. It was very, very Australian dominated. Um, I said I came towards the end of the season, but I mean we had we had plenty of Americans, um, but we had a heap of Aussies, and they weren't just, you know, they weren't all footy players. It was just, it was just a big bunch of Aussies, a few rugby boys, a few people who'd never played before, that sort of stuff. And the league was very much like that. And it was funny the first year we had. Oh, three, three like pretty handy Aussie on ballers leave, and all of a sudden it came to that 2000 season. I was like, "What are we going to do?" Like all of a sudden our whole engine room had gone, and that next year we had another three guys come that were you know bigger and better than the three we'd lost, and that sort of went for a couple of years. That sort of regular in and out, that rotation of and just that abundance of Aussies, and then it sort of stopped. And I think uh, part of it was like finances and the economic, uh, you know, after the 2008, everyone sort of tightened up on their purse strings and they weren't sending over these young Aussies for no particular reason. And uh, so we really had to invent, reinvent ourselves um, and look outside that natural uh, attraction of the Aussies and really, you know, focus on on the Americans or the non-Australians. Um, and especially in the Midwest, because I think the likes of, you know, the West and the East Coast in particular, you know, they're always going to have, uh, I guess, an abundance or, you know, more Aussies uh, available, so to speak. Whereas in the Midwest, it, it, you, you, you know, 
it's not this big Australian uh, mecca like the like these other like the likes of LA or New York or whatever. Um, so that was probably the biggest adjustment that uh, I've seen, um, and we've progressed from that going forward. I think the leagues played a big part of that, obviously, with their participation rules that they put in. I mean, as I said, there used to be none. You could have no Americans on the field whatsoever. Now, you know, it's, uh, you've got to prove that you're you know, the opposite way, if anything. So that's been the big part. Um, we did have a couple of other sort of break-off teams. At one point, we actually had almost, I think, three, three teams in Chicago. And in the end, we were, you know, it wasn't going anywhere, the three different teams. And we thought we can, that's when we started looking at that Metro focus, getting back to the one club, but, you know, enough people and, and competition to, to make it successful. So I think that's been a big part, the US focus and then the introduction of the Metro side of things. Yeah, you guys are honestly very similar to LA in terms, you know, both cities are so spread out. There's it's a great opportunity to kind of get regional sides. It's even in LA when we train. Uh, obviously, we have the organized group trainings, you know, either weekly or biweekly. But in terms of like you know running groups or workout groups, we've historically tried to um, you know mix it up a little bit. You know, you've got guys who are you know close to downtown. You've got guys in South Bay by LAX. You've got guys in Santa Monica, West Hollywood everyone's very spread out. So that can kind of be advantageous in terms of developing lots of talent in you know little neighborhoods. And that definitely serves people well when it comes to training cohesively as a group. And we've also got the boys out by Riverside or, you know, further east, northeast of LA, because, you know, we aren't doing Metro season this year, obviously, but Historically, we've done like a round robin metro season uh, where, you know, LA splits into three nine aside teams. We play OC, we play San Diego, kind of a round robin thing for the for like May, June, the first couple of months of the season. So I think Chicago, again, obviously, it's all a matter of who's registered, who's available to play consistently on a week in, week out basis. But, you know, there's a lot of positive things that can develop when it comes to being in a city where, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of people over a pretty wide geographic area. Yeah, I think one one of the big, and you did mention it, we used to have the downtown and then suburban suburb uh, suburban trainings. And then during the uh, weekends, we would do it out in the suburbs. And a lot of that was just field availability. Um, and so it takes a bit of coordination. And I'm sure some, you know, it's for all the advantages, it does sometimes, it is a disadvantage. I think another thing that we did uh, that did play well for us was securing a field or identifying a field that was on the lakefront. Um, you know, it's probably a bit smaller than what, you know, what I'd like, uh, but it's in a really, really good location. Um, it means I don't have to run as far and I seem to look like I kick a lot further, but it's not, it's all just, smoke and mirrors um but i think that's been a big part of it too being able to have it in the uh in the city versus the suburbs because it is it's like an hour drive you've got to go all the way out there just to uh you know to, to beat up in milwaukee each week um you know it gets old so we uh yeah i think the downtown has been the, the lakefront's been a huge thing what do you reckon Stu? yeah definitely it's um you know with a lot of like a lot of folks in the city don't have don't have a car so you know trying to get out to the suburbs like there's, there's no easy way out there so you know trying to keep things somewhat central is, is is key and then having that field you know right on the lake uh, lakefront with folks going up and down past it um you know just raises awareness of the game the amount of times you got people stopping and watching going what is this sport and then you strike a conversation it's been uh you know, we we have a relatively young team in terms of like the experience that we've got out here in Chicago, but um, but a lot of that has just been you know guys that have, and girls that have, that have come across the club just by, by um, you know either just passing us in training or or through our marketing efforts. So it's 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 good and it's um, but yeah, I just, like honestly, I, I can't see us getting back out to the suburbs anytime soon. And I know that isolates a lot of people that live out there, but it's just in terms of the logistics, it's it's, it's difficult. Um, just with this current playing group that we have. Yeah, I'm sure. And <laughs> playing on the lakefront, it, it's kind of like in Melbourne, you know, you're like when, when I, I was playing in the WRFL and, you know, you go down to Altona or Werribee or anywhere that's close to the water and it's, you know, 
middle of July, middle of winter, and it's 30 kilometer per hour winds. And you're like, oh God, like this is, <laughs> this is a nightmare, but uh, I'm sure you guys kind of run into the same thing in the windy city. But, uh, but yeah, I, I reckon that's a good, a really good plan. Cause like, if you guys want to play Milwaukee, I could imagine you could probably find a field like roughly halfway, you know, in Evanston or on the, on the North shore or anywhere where it's like, you know, almost halfway, you know, near the state line. So I imagine that you guys are, uh, w- whenever you are able to play closer to the coast, it's pretty advantageous for everyone. Yeah. And it's funny, we were talking about nationals at Racine last year, uh, a couple of years ago, how close it is for us. We were able to drive up and down. Um, I mean, to be honest with you, for Chicago to host something like the nationals, I mean, a very good chance that it would be somewhere, you know, not in Chicago, because you'll be hard pressed to find that sort of area. I mean, you can see it's hard enough in some of these smaller cities. So, you know, chances are it could be just as far as Racine or a good 45 minutes an hour out. So it's, um, yeah, very similar sort of setup there. Hey, Al, how long uh, had you, have you been doing the, um, the all-in-one training on the Riverside there? How long has that been going? Uh, I... 10, 10 years now, I think, something like that. I don't know, yeah, they all start yeah. to blur into each other. After ha, have you seen that's had an impact on your results? I mean, I, I, had the, I had the pleasure of actually filling in for Chicago. I remember at uh, regionals uh, back in Nashville. But one thing I've seen from your team, not just the great culture, but just how you're how, – I mean, you've had some amazing wins. You've beaten the likes of Dallas. You've beaten the likes of Denver. You've then – almost knocked them off again um you know and you've had some some other great wins as well you know nashville you've got a great rivalry there you know indianapolis you're you're beating them have you found that that's that that's had a a flow-on impact having that that you know regular training together as one um yeah like scary because he probably goes yeah training than i do Al, I can't remember the last time you were (laughs) training i think it was like 2015. Um, (laughs) Yeah, show, it shows up just that. Yeah, rules the roost. Um, no, but uh, yeah, I think like you know having those those training sessions together, um, and and constantly just you know you, you you get to know what your teammate can do. Um, and I think having you know that fluidity. I mean, pretty, honestly, if it show up at nationals, it'd be great. But um, but you know on the, on the one or two games that you know we'll we'll get things going like on on a good day, like we can. You know, we could we could nearly take the game to anyone. So, um, but yeah, I think you know some of the consistency that that we lack. You know, it's just it's we we kind of make up for it. Um, you know, whether it's uh, you know you got a couple of key, key folks that you know will run no matter no matter how many points you're down, they'll 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 keep going for it. Um, you know, and that kind of mentality of of a couple of couple of players, not Al, not myself, but some others will um, you know really drive the, the you know the you know, the, the pride of the city home. So, um, yeah, definitely. And I remember seeing a couple of, um, a couple of, uh, games that you guys played, uh, in 2017 nationals in San Diego, and you guys were going toe to toe again with your Minnesotas, your orange counties, all those div two sides, I guess for me, the question is, and this is something we kind of alluded to on, um, a previous podcast when we were, you know, talking to Wisconsin, uh, obviously Chicago, huge city, great club, great culture. What's the next step? How do you guys get to where you can consistently, you know, move up to Div 1 and, you know, compete with LA or Austin or Golden Gate or the New York pies, you know, like what, what do you guys think is the biggest ingredient that you're missing in order to take that next step and be able to play Div 1 and win in Div 1 consistently? Uh, so honestly, like if we were to, I feel like if we were to get up to to one, we'd lose somewhat of the social aspect of the club. Um, you know, we're not large enough to have, you know, everyone being that committed to, you know, to, to getting to that level, um, you know, anytime soon. And, and honestly, we're fine with that. You know, we're, we're first and foremost, a a social club, you know, we, we play footy, we love footy, you know, we want to win, of course, but, um, you know, more than that, the club's kind of uh you know what we're known for is 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 that social aspect especially in you know as ben um pointed out before having 
you know, a huge Australia Day party each year. We're somewhat of an institution in Chicago. Folks can reach out to us if they're, you know, looking for a place to stay or, 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 or jobs or anything like that. But, um, you know, getting us up to like a, a D1 level, I mean, we've got to, get, <laughs> got to maintain ourselves at a D2 level first. Um, but I think to, to get up there, I mean, we just the last couple of years started a women's team. So we're just trying to grow the club. So I think first and foremost, we're just trying to um, have, you know, a large influx of, of of new players coming in and teaching them the game, and you know, and, and in time it, it might evolve into you know in, into something like that. But um, you know, where we're currently at the moment, you know, we're, we we just want to make sure that you know we're, we're we're catering to the social aspect of the club. And maybe some folks that are, are new to the game, you don't want to come down just to get you know rolled over by guys that've been playing you know at a high level for the last six seven years. So. Um, yeah, I, th I think that, you know, that's what we're just focused on is just getting bodies on the field first, having consistent trainings where we're getting, you know, 20, 30 people down, men and women, um, and kind of going from there. Yeah, and here on the podcast, we've actually talked quite a bit about the social aspect of footy here in the U.S. And obviously, you know, everyone loves having a few for all these after the game, you know. Uh, taking the piss, doing all that good stuff. But it's also just really proactive in terms of helping new recruits feel at home, uh, helping women get involved and stay involved. It's very proactive, like, you know, whether it's a grand final party or an Australia Day party or any type of social event, really. It's something where not only does it help the team bonding, it definitely just uh, get, allows people to get around each other and uh, just enjoy each other's company. Yeah, um, one of the big takeaways I get from the from the football, and it's the same thing back home, is that, uh, well, back home, 21 years later, back in Australia, um, <laughs> is that club mentality and the social side of it. I mean, it's such a, you know, such an important part of, you know, your life, um, especially, you know, when you get into those regional areas, like in the country and what have you, like, it's, it's the it's the be all and end all of the town. You know, it's very much what, so there's obviously, there's positives and negatives to that. But I think, as you mentioned, like playing a game is one thing, but then going, um, you know, out with the rest of the team and having an event and the other team coming and, and whatever, it's, it's a lot more than just that sort of, you know, 12 inch, six inch softball game that you play on a Tuesday or whatever it is. It's a, it's a real, there's a real camaraderie and it's a, it's a, it's, it's, a little insight into how you know Australia ticks, I guess, and uh, there's there's a lot of that. It's like you play football for two hours and you hang out for twelve after that, or Stewie's case, probably seventy two. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, but I think that's a, a big part of it too. And, I mean, and Stewie mentioned touched on it too. I think a big thing, um, and I and for me, it's been a just because I said I haven't been involved in the club quite like I used to not to level like Stewie and such, but, you know, the, the women's involvement both on and off the field has been spectacular and such a such a breath of fresh air for us in the league, I think. Um, I'll be honest with you, I sort of, you know, there's, I'm a bit of a traditionalist. There's some things about footy that I don't think should change, whatever. I think the women's has been a, a great, uh, great improvement uh, for, and, and for the league and for us. Um, you know, we've got, Big parts of our uh, administration now are the women. Um, they've really, you know, they've grabbed it, you know, with two hands. Um, last nationals, I mean, you know, we had a pretty, pretty disastrous one on the men's side, um, but the women, you know, they they did everything they could and they got some wins and and a couple of medals and, you know, that was that was the highlight of our nationals. You know, if you take that out of it, we had a pretty ordinary weekend. But because of that and because of the, the club didn't, um, so yeah. I don't know, Al. I saw you Sunday morning. It looked like you had a pretty spectacular Saturday evening. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I, like having the girls girls down. Yeah, I mean they they're just taking like a yeah, as Al said, you know, taking um, you know the club to the next level. So when you, you ask like you know where you know where we're trying to go to is like, I mean we're we're trying to get the women's team down to grow the men's team, but now it's like well the women's team are much better than the men. So we're. Uh, we're we're excited to see to see where that goes. So, um, but yeah, I, I guess it's um, yeah, it's going to be interesting that what happens in the next couple of years. But some of the the new blood that we have down and some of the most um, you know heavily involved are you know a couple of key uh, women players too. So it's exciting times.
Yeah, absolutely. And it's something where, again, it's proactive. Like, you know, if you have a men's side and a women's side that are both growing and thriving and competing really well, that's that's a big deal because it's just a sign of a healthy club because, you know, if everyone's enjoying each other, everyone's having fun on the field and off the field, it's a, it, it creates a healthy club culture, as, you know, cliched as that might sound. Very true. That's, so, Stu, tell us a little bit. You you actually played in AFL Europe, yeah? Played out in Scotland? Yeah, I played for the uh, the Scottish national team uh, at two Euro Cups, and that's kind of like a, a tennis side tournament uh, that they do. I mean, um, you know, footy in Scotland is, uh, is different. They they play uh, rugby size fields, um, tennis side, but they, their competition is fantastic. You know, I follow most of the uh, um, most of the clubs over there, and um, you know, mates with. A, a number of the of the of the lads through playing with Scotland, and it is a different game, but it, definitely different to what we have in the U.S. But in terms of you know their commitments and their um, you know drive, uh, is is fantastic to see. So yeah, it's very different kind of um, setup that they have, but um, but it works for them. And you know I think you know, it could be an opportunity over here if we're if for kind of smaller sided games if uh, you know folks can't find space like you know we struggle to do sometimes. Yeah. And um, yeah, a lot of people don't know how big it's getting in Europe. You know, Germany made their first IC a few years back. So did Croatia. The the U.S. Revos are going to be touring Croatia. Uh, Not this year, obviously, but most likely next year. And uh, yeah, and we actually, funny that you mentioned Scotland, because a while back, uh, uh, when Kraz was still on the podcast, we had a guy from the uh, West Lothian Eagles who decide to slide into our DMs and he was like, Oh, love the show. Uh, any chance you guys want to interview me? And it's just like, Hmm, well, you know, it's like six, seven hour time difference, but yeah, one of these days. And, uh, obviously we do try to focus here on the podcast for, you know, American footy, but, uh, yeah, it's really exciting to see that it's doing so well in Europe. And obviously the Euro cup has been going on for quite some time now. And a lot of guys, uh, who play footy in the U.S. don't really have an exposure to that. So that's really cool that uh, you were able to participate, not just uh, in the States, but over in Scotland as well. Yeah, and I know exactly who you're talking about with the West Lothian Eagles. He's, uh, he does around in quite quite a few of his... Uh, he's the greatest salesman for the, for footy in Scotland, for sure. So, um, but yeah, it's, 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 definitely, it's definitely growing. I mean, you know, I had... Um, I can't remember the years now. It's starting to like I'll blur all together. But um, my first uh, Euro Cup with Scotland, you know, playing the teams again two years later and just kind of seeing a lot of the development, and just looking at the size of the, the the tournament growing too. I mean, they've got they've got a very well oiled uh, rig machine over there, and it's um, yeah, um, it's it, I, th- I think there's elements of it that you know that we can take from them and and, and do better, and you know, vice versa. But um, it is is a good fun and it's great to see you know just across you know two continents um, AFL really get a push. Absolutely, and um, I actually had a little bit of uh, I have a few connections to the AFL London competition, and I know they're doing very well over there. Um, a guy who played for the Dragons, uh, he's semi retired now, but uh, Chuka uh, Paul Francis, he's a he's a Brit. Uh, he played in AFL London for many years before he. Uh, he and his missus moved over to LA. And even in Australia, uh, one of my teammates was uh, Tyson Majacek, who is Brody Majacek's older brother. And uh, he lived in London for quite a while. He and his missus were there for a few years, I believe. And, uh, and you know, came back to Melbourne and wanted to get straight back into local footy. So he and I had a few good chats about, like, how AFL London, AFL England, all those organizations are are really doing a solid job because – there's always a big Aussie contingency in the British Isles, no matter where you are. So it's good to see that uh, it's doing so well overall. Yeah, the convicts came home. <laughs> Something like that, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, it's, I mean, everywhere you go, you always come across Aussies. Like it's, it's, and, and I think that's kind of why, you know, AFL has done so well. I mean, there's other, you know, sports, you know, take Gaelic football in Ireland. Like there's, there's pockets here and there. Um, but I mean, you, uh, you'd be hard pressed to find Gaelic football played in Croatia, but like Australian football, you're, you know, they've got, um, you know, quite a few teams out there and their, their national team are, are doing pretty well as well. Definitely. And it's funny that you say that. Cause um, 
uh, one of another one of my teammates in LA, uh, James Drummond. Yeah, Drummo, he uh, he uh, moved to LA around the same time I did. He's a good mate of mine, and uh, he's a Melbourne guy. Uh, and he before he moved to the states, he spent a decade in Malaysia. He was working for um, I like a white collar job in Malaysia, and he was saying that you know, in addition to footy, uh, they actually did have a decent sized Gaelic side, and you know, uh, there's a, a decent sized. Um, uh, Irish community over there. So you never know uh, where it's going to pop up in the world. And it's, it's funny that um, it's funny that uh, even in the most unlikely places, you'll, you'll run into it. Uh, in Ch- Hi, Stu, sorry. One thing I've noticed in Chicago is how everyone in the city that I've spoken to, a lot of people now know who the Swans are, not just Australians, the Australian community is definitely around the Chicago team, but it's also also the Americans that, you know, that I've spoken to that know that there's an Australian rules footy side. Like you said, you know, they watch you guys train. Um, what, how have you found the split, you know, currently going into this season? Is it, is it, there are a lot more Americans now that are, that are coming in and taking up the game? Yeah. I, and I think more, most importantly for us, it's um, a lot of the Americans are actually kind of taking, taking hold of the, the running of the club i think that's you know that is a key um aspect of, of growing the growing the game in uh, in the us is you, you, you whilst it's great having the, the aussies there to you know lay foundations because they've got the experience back in um you know back home but you know having americans running the club and getting involved getting their mates down and 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 kind of running through that that's that's key and yeah we we definitely pick up a few recruits on nights out for sure um yeah, we're not quite a bunch and we've kind of got some traditions that um you know definitely make us heard at nationals and at regionals involving a chicken and um yeah and kind of from that it's uh you know people are like what are you guys doing and it's like oh we're a, a footy club and people are like oh i remember seeing that on like espn 50 you know when i was in college and um and then they're like oh is that you know do you play over here and it's yeah you know follow, find us on facebook instagram and then we get them down and as soon as they come down to play they're like this is the greatest game and you know they see us night nice, nights out and it's like well you know how to have a good time so it's 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 kind of like a win-win across all facets yeah i reckon you guys need to get like a live swan mascot and just carry it around when you go to the pub after games and all that are you kidding me al mcglashens is the live swan <laughs> mascot <laughs> Stewie, you should have worn your uh, swan costume today right Luckily, it's just a podcast. And uh, yeah, yeah, I've got yeah. a couple of leftover drips and drabs from uh, a couple of Mad Mondays. Um, <laughs> could have pulled something out, but usually, uh, usually the outfit doesn't make it through the day. Especially presentation night, if you're wearing a nice red blazer, right, Al? <laughs> Going back to what you guys were saying, like I think that's the key for any U.S. club. You know, obviously, you need. Uh, a few Aussies at least just to guide everyone and coach everyone, make sure everyone's uh, doing the right techniques and uh, going at the footy really hard. But in terms of gradually kind of transferring that ownership to where the Americans can feel like, Hey, this is our club just as much as it's everyone else's. And, you know, I'm on the board here in LA and we try to, you know, divvy up the responsibilities where the Americans and the Aussies feel like they have, an equal stake, if you will, in the way the club is run, because that's something that's key to any team chemistry. You know, there's where there's no dramas, there's no resentments, everyone's willing to learn, everyone enjoys being a part of the club. So I reckon that's key to you guys in Chicago. It's key to every club because there needs to be, it's like everybody has to be a cog in the machine. And I think you guys are doing a good job at that. Yeah. Um, I, it ties in very much, I think, with on-field and off the field. I mean, it's like anything. It's what you what you put in is what you get out of it. I know that more than probably most people. But it's uh, it's funny as you were talking about, you know, the, the improvement, say, on the field, how to get onto DB one. I think part of the the understanding of Chicago and the uh, the reality is, you know, to to get to a certain level, you've got to have a certain caliber of player and the the league still has the ability it still can be dominated by the odd 
you know, Australian player that might have played at a couple of, at a very good level, not to take it away from the non-Australians, but it's still at that level where it can be. Um, so part of that, we, you know, on the field, um, yeah, we've all got aspirations of Divi 1 championships, um, but at the same time, and as Stewie mentioned, you know, the Midwest has been, uh, you know, traditionally been a, a, that Divi 2, we've had a strong championship uh, winners in Divi 2, competitive in Divi 1, but I mean, obviously that sort of comes, I think, down a little bit to the luck of the draw. Um, but the things we can control is the organisation off the field and what have you there. And I think that, as I said, Stewie mentioned, you know, traditionally, like I said, the transition from on the field and then off the field has, you know, gradually gone away from that Australian um, Australian role to the, the non-Australian. And, and I said, the women have played a big part of that. There was, we had a net, we got a netball team that's been in Chicago for maybe a dozen years now. And it's funny, they have, the, they have a different set up in that they have hardly any Americans at all because they don't need to because there's Australians, there's, you know, Caribbean, there's, you know, the English and all that. So they've got this, this constant flow. So they haven't had to rely on it. Whereas we've learnt, you know, and predominantly it's been more so on the field, but that's now uh, gradually transitioned off to the, off the field where we do have, uh, and not just um, people involved, but like key decision makers. And, and that's been a really, really big positive for us. Oh, I can imagine. And uh, yeah, and you kind of alluded to it previously that like being in the Midwest, Chicago's huge, but it, it can be a transient city depending on who you are and where you're from. Again, you know, the East Coast, West Coast teams uh, are usually going to land more Aussies than other cities. You know, that's just the reality of it. But um, but no, it's great in terms of just being able to uh, have the American guys learn from whoever. Like they, they might be here for three years. They might be here as long as you are, Al. So I think it's good to be able to... Uh, uh, to not view that as a weakness, but just as a way, hey, you know, there are these people, there are these Aussies that come through and some of them might be more transient than others, but it's still a great opportunity to just be a sponge and learn from them and just get around each other and help each other out on the field. So I think it's good to be able to take what could be a negative and turn it into a positive in terms of who's around and who isn't. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you on that. And it's, you know, it's said the, the inspiration that I've received and, and got from some of the uh, the non-Australians, um, you know, they had no preconceived idea of how the game should be played. And, you know, it's, I mean, I said 20 odd years still in the States, you know, I'll be walking down the street and I'll see something that'll still blow my mind. And I see it on the football field and I look at it, and I'm like, oh my God, what was this guy thinking? What was, why would you even try that? And they pull it off. And I'm like, you know, traditionally, you know, growing up with us with footy, it would just never, ever cross my mind to actually do that. Um, and sometimes it's not for the best, you know, I'll do something and it screws up. Then other times you're like, wow, I just, it wouldn't have crossed my mind and they pulled it off. So there's, there's, there's something special about that too. And I do appreciate it. And then again, part of it is the, you know, that, that learning curve and, and, you know, getting involved with a lot of Americans that are open-minded enough to, you know, have a, have a crack at something that, you know, doesn't make sense from, if you don't know the rules, it's, it's a crazy game. Um, but, you know, the people that are willing to, to give it a go and, and, and learn about it and, and dedicate to, you know, learning and participating, they see the results and they really enjoy it. And that's, a, that's a real kick for me. Um, 20 years later, I still get a buzz out of that. Exactly. And yeah, it, it should give you a sense of pride. It should give every Aussie a sense of pride because, you know, like, I mean, when I was first starting out and I didn't know what the hell I was doing, I was lucky to have people who were encouraging me, people at the club who appreciated my enthusiasm, even though I was still brand new to the game. And I think it's great, you know, whenever you kind of see the light bulb go off in people's heads and they're finally learning how to, handball perfectly or have a kick from the goal square you know it's it's a really it's a really awesome thing to see and i think it gives everyone a great sense of accomplishment but especially the aussies just seeing their game take off in ways that people would never have expected you know 20 30 40 years ago 
Yeah, I mean, I remember the first time I saw Stewie handball. It was it was spectacular. Um, it was yeah, but uh, no, I think and I said the women come into that as well because a lot of them traditionally haven't played it at all. Um, you know, it's only fairly new in Australia as well. Um, so from from that side of it, yeah, there's there's all that. Um, again, yeah, I'm not a big proponent of the handball. Um, if I can get it on the foot, I will have a crack at it, but. Uh, it is, it is, it is really encouraging to see that and to see people learn the game and then bring in. I said, start when you start learning something from somebody that hasn't um, hasn't played it before, and it's sort of like a new employee coming from a different company. You know, they bring a, a similar skill set, but there's some different experience, and all of a sudden, like, yeah, you know what? That's a that's a really cool thing. We'll try that, and you know, when it works, it's it's quite spectacular. Definitely. Yeah, so I saw that uh, pretty evident at, at regionals, actually, like I mentioned there in Nashville, you know, your, your first game, you know, it was a tough game against Austin. Uh, but from there, you, you actually got better. You actually took a lot from that game. And like you said, a lot of those players that were new to the game, um, you know, your, your performance against, against Nashville, it just grew from there. And I, I watched, uh, I actually watched your game, I believe it was against Houston last year in, in Denver. And you can just see the the improvement of a lot of those American guys that you know, as you mentioned before, that are that are newer to the game, and just how far they've come, uh, you know, just from the experiences they've had and the opposition they've had as well. It's definitely evident. Yeah, I think it's funny. So over the years, I was always a proponent. I actually was never a big fan of tournaments. Um, I was like, and I still think I prefer the the full length game, but I do appreciate them. I've learned to appreciate them, and it's. I've had some amazing weekends of football, both on and off the field, but let's stick to on the field. Um, and the progression that you can see from someone that may have never played the game before or is very new from the first game on the Saturday morning to how they're playing, you know, either that afternoon or like the Sunday afternoon, it's they're two different players. And it, it's, it's really good to see and encouraging and, and you know, makes it all worth it when you see that transformation and you know picking you know obviously listening they're learning they're observing and and then practicing and executing and that's that's you know that's where i think at my point of my career uh, if you call it that you know i'm at the wrong end of it now i'm not you know i'm not trying to win games off my own boot even if i still do but uh um it's 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 really nice to see that, and I said it's and I said it, it pays off. I think the coaches, because a lot of them now are these younger guys that we have, they get the encourage, they see that, and they get encouraged to keep doing it too. Because you've got to get, you know, that sort of that role of it too. The administrators and the coaching, like they've got to see those results as well. Otherwise, they're going to lose enthusiasm, and it's so so important enthusiasm in a club. Um, you can see how far it will take you out of bad situations into winning situations. So that's been a, you know, a really big part of it too, that, that natural progression. Yeah, and that's all you can ask for. It's uh, just asking people to play their role and do their best and give it a red hot crack. Well, Stu, Al, thanks so much for joining us. Obviously, we wish you all the best and hopefully the season gets kick-started in a relatively short period of time and we'll be Looking forward to catching up with you guys again soon. Yeah, no, cheers. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thanks, guys. All the best. Stay safe. Cheers, boys. Outside 50 is brought to you with the help of Play Aussie USA. Play Aussie is the only place in the USA you can buy the famous Sharon football, a proud sponsor of the USAFL. Visit them at playaussie.com.